China, one of the largest and most populated countries on the planet. Its economy has grown faster in the past three decades than any other nation on earth. If this were happening in your own country, it would be cause for celebration. And for a while, the world celebrated China's economic fortunes. The price of consumer goods plummeted in the West and modernization was seen in the East. However, this perspective began to change as China began to purchase the debts of sovereign nations, including that of the United States. As of August 2014, China is the largest foreign holder of US debt. Concerns about China overtaking the United States economically, technologically, and even militarily have led to political commentators on the right. Don't look now, but America's days as the top economic superpower are numbered. China now set to grab the top spot as early as this year. And the left. Job loss, unfair trade, that more than six in ten Americans are viewing China's rise as a threat to U.S. economic security. To ring the warning bells about the sleeping dragon of the East. Are these concerns legitimate? Is China really going to overtake the United States economically, let alone technologically or militarily? If not China, then is there any Asiatic power that can challenge the United States for control of the Pacific? Are we seeing the decline and fall of the American empire? Let's connect the dots. After the communist takeover of China in 1949, the country was run by Mao Zedong off and on until his death in 1976. During his premiership, a large number of failed policies led to economic stagnation and famine. The conservative estimate for the death toll under his reign is 40 million. However, China's economic fortunes began to change in 1978 when Deng Xiaoping gained control of China and began economic reforms which were integral to China's rise in the last 30 years. China's economy has grown between 8 and 10 percent annually since the early 1980s. Thanks to a large, low-skilled population, China has gained control of a large portion of the world's manufacturing. This has led to lost jobs in more modernized nations. This growth has led the Chinese government to purchase the soft sovereign debts of foreign nations. As of August 2014, China owns 1,270.9 billion, which accounts for over 21% of US foreign debts. They are building massive amounts of roads and high-speed rail lines while constructing an increasing number of urban dwellings for migrants, leaving the rural interior to work and live in the coastal provinces. Fear of Chinese technological prowess has also gripped the world. Hackers based in China have been reportedly responsible for numerous thefts of technological and intellectual property. American and other Western companies have been the targets of these attacks. In Shanghai is located a compound that hosts the People's Liberation Army's Unit 61398, whose stated purpose is to perform harmful computer operations. In other words, the PLA has a cyber warfare division. The Chinese government and associated entities are using stolen technology to advance their economy. There is also fear that cyber weapons are increasingly able to cause collateral damage, and that a digital Pearl Harbor is only a matter of time. This combines with the fear that the US is falling behind countries like Russia and China in terms of cyber capabilities. As China's economy grows, so does its influence abroad. China is engaging in construction and development projects across the developing world, in particular in Africa, where Chinese companies are building roads, bridges, and other infrastructure projects in order to ease the extraction of raw materials. China has also been making inroads into Latin America, especially to Venezuela, known for its oil wealth and general anti-US sentiments. As more and more people in China acquire cars, the necessity for acquiring more oil is prime. This has led China to improving its relationships with Middle Eastern nations, in particular Iran, another nation known for its anti-American sentiments. After the collapse of the Soviet Union, China began to form a new association of states in order to oppose NATO. After the collapse of the Soviet Union, China began to form a new association of states in order to oppose NATO. This organization is known as the Shanghai Cooperation Organization. It consists of China, Kazakhstan, Kyrgyzstan, Tajikistan, Uzbekistan, and Russia. Along with these members, there are a number of observer states such as India, Iran, Mongolia, Pakistan, and Afghanistan. These member states have participated in joint military exercises in the same way that NATO occasionally does. On top of this, China uses North Korea's seemingly unpredictable behavior as a constant foil on the West, offering to calm it down in exchange for a loosening of international trade restrictions. China not only has the largest population in the world, but also has the largest standing army. They have over 2.2 million active duty soldiers and 2.3 million reservists, which is double that of the United States. China has also been expending a lot of resources to build up its blue water navy. 
In 2012, its first modern aircraft carrier was launched. Though still much smaller than the Navy of the United States, China doesn't need to drive the US out of the Pacific. Rather, China's naval ambition is to build up its access denial capability. In other words, to prevent the US ability to attack mainland China and to resupply its regional allies. With all of this standing before us, it is easy to understand why some believe that China is an inevitable superpower capable of taking out the United States. However, let's look at the less known facts about China to see why this is not quite the case. The biggest supporting fact for China's rise is its economy. However, there are cracks within that are not very publicized but run very deep. The first is that China's growth rates of 8-10% to are not sustainable. Within China, there is a huge disparity of wealth. Of the 1.3 billion people in China, over a billion of them live in abject poverty, earning 6 or less dollars a day. On top of low incomes, China is also starting to see its cost of production rising, meaning that there are fewer jobs available. The wealth disparity is not only inequitable based upon profession, but also based on geography. The inland provinces are largely rural, while the coastal provinces are largely industrial. Differing economic interests threaten to divide the people of China along economic lines. The Chinese government has attempted to mitigate this by moving more manufacturing inland and moving more people from the countryside to the cities. This policy has resulted in China building ever-increasing amounts of railway to move people and an increasing amount of urban cities. The problem is that these cities remain empty. With fewer and fewer jobs available, people from the inland provinces are not going to the coastal cities. And all Although moving manufacturing further inland may decrease labor costs, it has increased transportation costs, making very little difference overall. Like the US and the rest of the world, the People's Republic has a sovereign debt problem. When you combine local governments and different institutions within China, the total approximate debt is $17.6 which is higher than the US debt and double the size of its economy. Though the share per capita may be less than that of the US, most people in China are too poor to make a significant contribution to paying down such a national debt. On top of all of this is a rising demographic crisis within China. Half a century of the one-child policy has taken its toll. The male-to-female ratio is not conductive to proper population growth or maintenance. There is a large number of young Chinese men who are coming of age in a time where there are not enough women to date or marry. This is on top of there being fewer jobs available. Many have gone to work with mining companies in eastern Russia, which is causing tensions between the two countries. Ultimately, the economic fortunes of China are not quite what they seem. When it comes to cyber capability, the revelations of Edward Snowden about the NSA data harvesting at the prison facility has proven that not only is the US government better at digital warfare, it is using them more rapidly on its own citizens. And the fact that they have to steal technology from the US shows that they do not yet have the ability to develop new advanced technology for themselves. The Chinese government is also in shaky condition. The leadership is divided between two rival factions, the Tuan Pai and the Princeling. The Tuan Pai are populists who are more in line with traditional communists. The Princelings are more aligned with entrepreneurs. These rivals have a history of accusing each other of corruption and putting the other on trial. Outside the leadership, there are a large number of anti-government movements. Several religious groups, such as Christians and the Falun Gong, are known for openly or secretly opposing the Beijing government's policies regarding the free practice of religion. The Falun Gong have gotten much attention in recent years for their more open activism. The Tiananmen Square mass massacre demonstrates the opposition of students to government policy. And with the growing number of Chinese students being exposed to Western society while studying abroad, it is likely that the opposition this group opposes to Beijing will increase. There are also increasing regional resistances. In Hong Kong, the people do not favor a formal union with China, and Tibet has been a sore point for China on the international stage for decades. On top of internal forces forming opposition to the communist regime, other nations in the region have also strongly opposed China's expansion and aggression. First and foremost, there is Japan, who has the most technologically advanced armed forces native to the Asia-Pacific region. Along with this, they have the largest fleet native to the Pacific, easily outpowering China. South Korea, one of the Asian tigers, has a vibrant economy more than capable of funding a sufficient military capable of defending against North Korea and China. Taiwan also does not want to fall under the control of the China mainland, and is more than motivated to do what's necessary to resist the People's Republic. India is also a rising power in the region. With its own ambitions and with a population level that rivals China, it has the manpower to field just as large of an armed forces. Along with them are the states of Southeast Asia, who have a history of being under a Chinese 
thumb, and would be very interested in putting the sleeping dragon in its place. Ultimately, these powers all have an interest in keeping China in check, and all have been increasing military spending to do so. Geography also plays a role in limiting the potential power of China. They have only one direction in which to direct their sea power, while the United States and Japan have two. Western China is filled with deserts and mountains, which are not easy project power across. On top of this, China does not have an overabundance of natural resources required for an industrialized economy. This is why China is spending money on extracting resources from Africa and Latin America. If China is not a long-term threat to the United States, then who might be? The only Asiatic power the United States has ever gone to war directly with was Japan. For many centuries, Japan, like most other powers in Asia, was under the tributary rule of China. However, during the 19th century, China was dealt several blows by the Europeans and by the end of the century, by Japan itself. Japan began to modernize after an American fleet led by Commodore Matthew Perry in 1854 arrived in Uraga Harbor near Tokyo and demanded that they open their ports. Since that point, Japan made the decision that it must modernize or be colonized. They chose the former and by the beginning of the 20th century, they had the strongest industrialization and military native to the Pacific. In 1904, they fought a war with Russia and won, being the first non-Western power to defeat a Western nation. They quickly entered the Imperial game by conquering Korea, Taiwan, and a number of islands in the Pacific. Geographically, Japan is short on natural resources. This is why in Japanese culture, everything must be used as efficiently as possible. This is especially seen in warfare where metal armor is rare. The swords of the samurai are known for being very strong, precise, and sharp. This is a result of the need for perfection driven by a lack of resources. As Japan industrialized, it needed raw materials it did not have. So they imperialized other nearby Asiatic territories. Being an island nation, Japan by necessity must have its sea lanes open and have access to raw materials through them. The U.S. placing embargoes on these goods is what led to Japan attacking Pearl Harbor and declaring war on the United States. After maintaining its sovereignty, Japan's highest priority is maintaining sea lane access to resources, because without it, Japan would starve economically. After World War II, Japan was occupied by the United States, who very quickly poured resources into Japan to help it recover and fight the Soviets in the East. Japan has the highest quality military in East Asia, easily overshadowing China. And this is with its constitution forbidding it. Imagine what would happen if they actually changed it to allow them to have a military. The Japanese Self-Defense Forces, or JSDF, has seen action abroad. In the 90s, Japan sent troops in a UN peacekeeping mission to Cambodia and Mozambique. In 2004, they sent troops to Iraq to aid in peacekeeping and reconstruction. In 2005, they were sent to Indonesia to aid in relief after after the 2004 tsunami. The JDSF has sent its maritime forces to the Horn of Africa to defend ships against Somali pirates. Japan has even opened a base in Djibouti for anti-piracy purposes. Fact of the matter is, is Japan is far more militarily active than China and is far better equipped. But why would Japan want to fight the United States? The fact is that they do not. The Americans don't want to fight the Japanese either, but economics may force a conflict between the two. Since the beginning of the Cold War, Japan's defenses and access to raw materials has been largely protected by the United States. The United States has free trade agreements with Japan. However, these are one-sided trade agreements. The US doesn't place tariffs on Japanese goods, but Japan does have tariffs on American goods. You will not find many foreign goods in Japan that are not physically manufactured there. The opposite is true with the United States. Cheaper Japanese goods such as cars and electronics are all over the American market, while the Japanese only buy Japanese-made goods. Japanese companies are not in a very good state. Many of them are deeply in the red, but the only thing keeping them going is quick cash flow from the United States. They have been selling at a loss for years, and so they managed to stay afloat by meeting the bare minimum cost of expenses. If Japanese businesses were to face fair competition with foreign made goods, this could cause many of their companies to go under and potentially send them into an economic tailspin. As economic recovery in the United States drags on, there will be increased demands to either stop 
stop the importing of foreign goods or for other countries to be required to open their markets to American goods at fair prices. Japan's defense and economic strength has been reliant upon U.S. goodwill. However, with the end of the Cold War a generation old, we see greater calls for normalization of relations with Japan. The Japanese want the current status quo to remain, while more and more Americans want freer trade or outright trade war. Despite economic theory claiming this would be harmful to the U.S., at this time it would be more harmful to Japan. So the question here is whether Japan is willing to destroy itself economically in exchange for peace. It was not willing to do so in the 1930s, but would they now? You don't have to look very far to see or hear someone talk about the United States being in decline. It's one of the few things many on the right and the left agree on. Those on the left believe we are in decline because we do not trust our government, and those on the right think we trusted our government too much. A slow economy, jobs disappearing, and a growing number of people on welfare. It's very easy to believe that America's best days are behind her. Go to your local bookstore and you will see an endless stream of books from politicians and political commentators about how the US is in trouble and how to fix it. It's tempting to fall in the pattern of declinist thought, and it's a fair enough question to ask. Those that believe the US is in decline like to point to the examples such as Rome, the British Empire, or even the Soviet Union for signs of our demise. The declining power of our currency and decline respect for our government abroad makes it seem that someone is going to overtake us at some point soon. In order to take advantage of the growing East Asian economy, the Obama administration has been attempting to redirect America's foreign policy with what has become known as the Asian Pivot. Americans are filing a smaller percentage of the world's patents. And whether right or wrong, those predicting an impending global economic crash are a dime a dozen. Failures of foreign policy such as the Arab Spring, the Russian invasion of Ukraine, and nuclear proliferation by North Korea and Iran are signs of our failed world leadership. Are we really in decline? It is undeniable that things are looking bad right now. But this has happened before. Throughout the history of every country and empire in the world, you see a pattern of declinist thought that follows defeats in wars, downturns in the economy, and losses in prestige. I wish I had a more concrete answer than what I'm about to give you. I do not think America is in decline. We do face hard times. As Thomas Paine said in American Crisis, these are the times that try men's souls. There are many people, and especially a growing number in the United States, who do not believe in American exceptionalism. As a learned person, I understand the complaints about this concept. I believe in American exceptionalism, just as I suspect that the Brits believe in British exceptionalism and the Greeks believe in Greek exceptionalism. However, I say that there is a difference in the American character, something that most cultures around the world lack. There is a belief that the people can save themselves and that they will save themselves. The powers of government are limited, but the power of the people are nearly infinite. The US economy is still over 20% of the total world economy. That is produced by only 5% of the world's population. Statistics show that Americans are far more likely to donate to charity, to do volunteer work, or even to help strangers. If that's not exceptionalism, I don't know what is. This is what gives me and a good number of others hope for America's future, its people. We now can see that the hype and fear over China's rise has been overblown. Chinese history is one of frequent patterns. Civil war and fractioning account for almost half of the Chinese civilization's history, and its history shows that China is either rich and divided or poor and united. Japan, the often overlooked adversary, has the most reason to fear conflict with the United States, and both nations' economies are affected by the current status quo. But with the rise of executive power, militarization of local law enforcement, and a growing surveillance state, the real question of the future is not whether America will be powerful, but whether or not her people will be free. Thanks for watching.